Welcome to our live event today. We are going to be working on making some bibs for young children. So we're going to have a couple different sizes that we're going to work on. You may have seen this in the past, or maybe as you scrolled through all of our different videos, you thought, oh, I missed that one. Well, we're bringing it back. It was well received the first time. So we're going to um, bring it back as um, kind of a, a throwback for a really good projects, a way to use up batting scraps leftover pieces of fabric you just don't want to part with by throwing in them in the wastebasket. Everything's useful. You know that as quilters. So if you haven't downloaded the pattern yet, um, the download link will be in the um, comments section. So make sure that you either down, you know, remember to go back and download. If you already have it, grab something to write with so that you can make some notes as we go along. I'm Colleen Tauke. I'm your instructor for our project today. So if you're new to watching our live events, um, all of our patterns are downloadable free. You just have to put in an email and you get the pattern, um, be able to download that for free along with the templates. All of our videos do live forever on our Facebook page, the YouTube page, and on the website. So no matter which platform you're, you're um, coming from, remember to go back and look in the tabs for videos or live events. You will find all of our projects there. So if you're popping in and think, oh, I have to run errands or I have to be someplace in 20 minutes and I'm going to miss the end of it, remember that all of our live events do live forever in our within our website, our, our um, YouTube page, our um, and, and through Facebook. There's always access. So no matter and if you're waking up and going to work and saying I'm not going to get there, this your time is. We are producing things for you too at your pace. So you can even just work on the project with me by hitting pause. And then if you know if you want that personal one-on-one -on -one instruction, that's one way to do it so that you can pause and actually do the project with me if that's the way you learn best. So also remember that in the comment section under um, the video, put in comments, let us know where you're watching from today. Um, I, those names that are very familiar to me, I love to see that we have usually Judy popping in from over the pond. We have a whole bunch of Canadians who come in and watch. We usually have from the East Coast to the West Coast as we wake up the United States and even in South America or in Africa. So if you are watching us from outside the U.S., let us know where you're, uh, where you're watching from. And you know me, I will come in at the end. Um, later on today, and because I don't have time to do comments live, then I will chat with you afterwards if you have a question that I did not get to. So if I go quickly through something also, I tend to, by nature, talk fast. So if there is something you need clarified, drop in that comment section and say, hey, wait, wait, what was it that you were using? How are you doing that? Can you show us a little closer up and I can bring it closer to the camera for you? Um, teaching is kind of second nature to me. So, um, and sometimes I get on a roll. So slow me down if we need. Okay. We have, and I can't exactly read the name. Denise says hello from O'Fallon, Illinois. That's just a neighbor to the east of me. It's going to be a little interesting here in the Midwest today. Another set of rumbling storms coming through today. So also hello from Indiana. So we've got, got some of the Midwest awake and watching. So here we go. Bib Building 101. Now, this was inspired because I now have six soon to have, let me think, Soon to have seven. I always have to think about how many there are. Seven grandkids. So, of course, these were inspired by little people who come and are always eating at our house. And there's always messy food. So you kind of need something to cover up that middle section. So you're going to get two templates within the pattern. So when you download the pattern at the back, you will find the templates for both of the sizes of bibs that we're going to be make, making. And... As you look at them, because of the size, not everything's going to fit on one piece of paper. Now, when you go to print, remember, make sure that your computer or your tablet or whatever you're using, print actual size. Now, bibs are a little forgiving in size. 
your templates when assembled and all together should measure about 11, 11 and a half inches for the small one, 14 to 14 and a half for the large one. That's in length. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So from top to bottom on the short one, around 11 and a half or so, 14 and a half or so on the large one. If it's off by a little bit, it's going to be okay. So if you have issues with the printer, don't worry on that one. Okay. They are also labeled so that the small bib prints on two pieces of paper. You're going to be overlapping them and putting together the top piece that kind of the connection to the bottom. So you have the entire shape. And then on the larger one, because of its size, we had to do quadrants if that makes sense at all. So you have the two pieces that look like this for the large um, bib, and you're going to be putting them together. I've already taped this one, so it makes it a little easier. The part that goes around the neck and the bottom portion of this, but this now says this is on a fold. So remember, this is only gonna be half now, so that it makes sense when you look at it, that's half of a bib. So you're gonna wanna double this to make the entire shape or just cut out half and mark that half line. Now, I usually, when I have templates, I always make extra copies because I want to keep the original because paper templates in my sewing space are going to end up gone. And that way the original stays with the pattern. So make that extra copy. And then um, in the, in the tracing process, cut this out, make half, flip it over, trace the other side, or you can cut this out so you can flip it. I like to transfer all of my templates to template plastic. You could use cardstock, you could use a poster board, um, something that has a somewhat rigid edge to it so that it's easy for you to trace. Now, those paper templates might go away, but these plastic templates may live along with my rulers so that I can come back to them later. It gives a nice edge when you use the template plastic something to drive that pen around because when you trace these this is going to be your stitching line so it'll be very exact so those templates are very very useful then um, in putting together uh, in the shape and giving you a, a stitching line okay you got templates kind of covered there so whether you, you use a poster board um, some cardstock um, use template plastic, whatever is your favorite go-to thing. Make sure that you, if you're going to be making more than one, maybe you make one and then say, hmm, yeah, I want to make a bunch of these, maybe for a craft show, maybe for family members as shower gifts, maybe for a church bazaar, whatever that is, you may then want to transfer that shape to your template plastic. So make sure that you have that available. Um, Okay, don't have any other comments right now. So let's get into the things that we're going to need to create our um, fun little bibs. And when I talked about having batting scraps, most of us as quilters, when we get done trimming our quilt after it's been layered and quilted, we always have these strips of batting and we never know what to do with them. We hate to throw anything away. So, of course, that's where batting strips like this, then come into the most useful spot is that you can go back and cut those into chunks and making sure that you put the right side of the batting up because you're, you're going to want to stitch through this as if it was in a quilt. You're going to trace that template onto the batting. So simple as that is put the template right on top. And this is where you can either use a marker, you can use a friction pen, whatever you have available that will make a mark along the batting at this point. Now, if you use a friction pen, remember it's heat sensitive. So if you put an iron on there, your line's going to go away. Or use just a regular marker. We're going to be stitching and covering up the line on the batting portion. So that template is really useful to then do that really quick trace around onto your batting. So those batting scraps, cut them up into the size that you need, um, whether you're making the small or the large bib. So we've used those up. Now it's going in to find those fabrics that 
create the bibs. Now let's go through the ones that I have here. So this is for inspiration on color possibilities. We have that neutral into navy blue. Some I have these as a set of pre-cut strips. Um, these were left over from I I think these came were used in a project and they had leftover pieces of this little bicycle print. Now I couldn't throw that away. Those were just absolutely too adorable. And of course, there's always those neutral, those blenders that you have in your collection. I had some yellow, I had some turquoise, perfect to match up with those. Some more of the navy blues, some of these funky orange and floral um, pieces with some turquoise in there and some burgundy. So any leftover strips, any leftover pieces can very easily be created into this bib um, project. Now, that's the front. So we're going to collect up, say, um, some neutrals for one of the uh, demos we're going to do here today. I have some leftover, fabulous, fun Easter, little chicks with Easter bunny ears on to make a uh, Easter bib for my youngest granddaughter. And of course, you know, those colors, pinks and turquoise and yellows that look like Easter eggs. So we have strips. And they can be even pieces that are chunked into rectangles and squares. And I'll show you how you can utilize all of those pieces within the build, bib building process. So collect up a set of fabrics. Maybe you want to do something, if you want to do something for a craft fair, maybe you want some Christmas themed ones. These are leftover from project that I made, a stars quilt. So. You know, when you get down to two or three inch strips, again, those are perfect for this kind of a project. Or maybe you want to do Halloween themed. These are leftover strips from a table runner I made um, a few years ago. And those would be perfect for this project also. So whether they're strips or rectangles or squares, they can be used up. The other things you need to pull out, and I did not, let's see. I've got some Velcro here. A lot of times I will use a very neutral um, tan, gray, something that's just kind of, or even a white um, hook and loop tape. Now I've referred to this as hook and loop tape in the past. And I got a little pushback that people didn't quite know what I meant. Hook and loop tape is just a generic term for Velcro. So if where you shop, Velcro is what you can find. Other places may have other brands, but hook and loop tape. One side has little hooks and one side has little loops and it makes a closure. That's what I use on mine, but I have found out that if you have kids who have long hair, maybe this little plastic snap closures may be more advantageous because it doesn't catch hair, long hair in the closure. So. You can use the Velcro for your closure. That's what I have listed in the supply list. And only a little one inch square is all you need to complete a project like this. So whether or not it's a Velcro, hook and loop tape, a plastic snap process, um, or even a metal snap if you happen to have some leftover from previous projects, but um, any of those for the closure on, on the back of it. Then some neutral colored thread, of course, that marking pen, either a friction pen or some kind of fabric marking pen, something that will show up on your batting we talked about. We need some larger scissors and then some thread snips for doing some clipping at one, at one point. So something with a very nice sharp point will be um, to your advantage. And then simple rotary cutter ruler, all those necessities like a seam ripper just in case you make it loose. So we will get into building our bib project. Let's move this out of the way just temporarily. And we are going to work. We've got the idea that we're um, creating the shape on template. We already talked about tracing that to those wonderful batting scraps so that you have the shape then so you know what you're needing to cover for the front side of your bib. And then you will also use this to trace the shape onto something that's going to be a backing fabric. Now your backing fabric, most of these, I guess I probably had just purchased a lot of 
or had leftover maybe a lot of gray fabric and just did neutral grays on the back of all of mine so that it was simple i had yardage i could use up so you can use just a neutral on the back but you could also use any print any design on the back of the bib so on this one we're going to take our small template and i'm going to trace my shape onto the backing fabric also and it should be on the wrong side of the fabric in this case it's a solid so you can't really tell right side or wrong side so i'm just going to trace the shape because later when we sandwich this all together this will actually be our stitching line for putting the back and kind of finishing off our project so this is where having that nice rigid piece of sh or, um, shape makes it very easy to outline the bib shape. And I'm tracing it a couple of times just so my line's a little bit heavier. So it's a little easier to see under the sewing machine. So now I have my shape traced onto my the wrong side of my backing fabric as well as the right side of my batting. Now some might ask, there's a right side and a wrong side to batting. And yes, there is. Batting for most of us has been needled. It means it's been um, textured so that it doesn't stretch out of shape. Now this is a piece of warm and natural. There are a lot of battings that we use for machine quilting and they all have that same needling process. So when you look at your batting, on the front side, it kind of looks like little dots or little holes have gone down through the batting. And if it kind of poofs up, that's the right side. And on the back side, it's usually the messier side. Usually you see little tiny kind of nubs of batting, that's the back side. And it even has a rougher feel to it. So that's the back side of the batting. And the top side is a little softer, fluffier feel to it. So now you know the difference between right side and wrong side. And we're going to be building on the right side of that batting. We're going to put our backing fabric out of the way for now. And we can build in a couple of different ways. We can either build with small pieces. And usually what I do is, since this is a quilt as you go kind of technique, but we're not going through the backing fabric. We're just going to use the batting. I usually kind of pick the, the middle piece of the front of the bib to do my build. So I would lay my first piece on the right side up. And then maybe I want to add a piece to each side of that. And I'm going to build a strip so that I will be able to cover all the way out and over these marked lines. So I'm going to take my first piece that I want to put on. I'm going to put right sides together. So this one's facing right side up. My next piece is going to face down. And I'm always kind of want to make sure that my pieces have straight edges where I'm going to be stitching. I don't want a wobbly edge because what I want to do is make a nice straight seam. So I'm going to use that outer edge. This one has a little tiny nick in it here, but the, these lines are, are fairly straight so that I can lay that on there and use that as my guide for my quarter inch seam. So I lay that down using that nice straight edge as my quarter. I'm gonna do that first stitch line there. And whether or not it's perfectly placed really doesn't matter. You could try to make a nice meridian line, find the center if you're worried about it being perfectly straight. But remember, it's a bib. Food's going to get spilled on it, and it might break your heart if it if you create this absolute heirloom bib that somebody's going to spit you know juice on or something. So fairly straight, but not worrying overly worried about everything being perfect. Now we have right sides together. I have my first seam put in there, and I'm going to then open out this piece that I just attached all the way to that seam allowance. I'm going to score it with my finger. Okay, I've got a question come in from Erica. She says, good morning from Maryland. Yay, we got the East Coast. <laughs> I have twin baby girls. Oh, wonderful. 
or what baby girl cousins arriving in August. Wow, that's great. So this is a perfect project and you have plenty of time to get them done. In fact, you'll probably make the small version and the large version because, you know, this is for when they first start to eat and then the larger ones for when they really get messy because that's what kids do. <laughs> okay, so we've got our first piece attached. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to keep covering until I get to the outer edge of one side here. So I'm going to take my next one, right sides together, and I'm going to lay that on top so that I can do my quarter inch seam again. These were pieces that came as pre-cut strips. So I know that the pinked edge is straight and I can use the top of the piece of that pinked edge so I can get my quarter inch seam. But you know, if it's not absolutely perfect, it's not the end of the world. There we go. Remember, someone is going to mess, probably um, end up spilling food on it as you go. Okay, here we go. Now we're going to open this one up and press, just finger press all the way out to the outer edge. Now this piece, uh, sorry, it is cream color, but it does cover that black line, which is the outer edge of our project. And I just realized my bobbin thread is very low so i'm going to pull out a bobbin here we go or maybe not maybe i'll just have to wind a bobbin as we discuss what we're doing next i guess i will be winding a bobbin okay so before you start maybe the best thing to do is to sit and wind a few bobbins so that you don't have to stop in the process to wind a bobbin I don't usually use up that much thread when I'm doing demos, but I have run out of bobbin thread. Okay, so in this process, more than likely, you're going to be using a cream, a gray, something light colored uh, so that you can do your stitch as you go process. But you're also probably going to want to grab a fun thread to do the quilting process because after we get done covering the entire batting section, we're going to go back and we're going to do some machine quilting on that portion. And this is also a really good place for you to maybe do a little dabbling in machine quilting if you haven't done a lot of machine quilting yet at this process at this time because our piecing tends to advance quite quickly. Our machine quilting tends to lag just a little behind because it's very intimidating to, um, to do the machine quilting. A lot of us get really worried about, well, everybody's gonna see it, will it be perfect? I don't know where, how to place my hands, I can't keep my stitch length even, do I just stitch in the ditch? Do I do outlining? So many questions. So this is a really good place on a small project to do that practicing of machine quilting. So now that we have bobbin ready to go, again, we just are going to grab another piece or two to put, let's see, I want to get all the way to the outside edge there. Okay, so I'm going to add one more piece and then we're going to talk about how you would go about covering from that point to get the rest of the bib surface covered. Okay, now this piece was narrower and it will create a um, kind of a, hmm, now how do I cover that? And that's what I wanted to make sure that I showed you. Okay, the small thread snips here. Now, if your pieces are not all the same width as you're doing this, your next pieces are going to need to cover all of the stair step look that you have going top and bottom of that section. So you're going to need longer strips in order to cover this. So let me see if I can find a dark color that will show up just a little bit better on camera there. See, the, oh, that was a little piece left over. This is what's left from a baby quilt I made for one of my grandkids. So there's not a whole lot of things left. Okay, I'm gonna cut a piece that will go the entire width of the bib. And I'm going to place it along the shortest area there. 
So what I'm going to do, let me grab my display board here. So what I want to do is make sure that I, I cover up all of those pieces, including this guy right here. I can't go way out here on the edge because then I won't have um, covered these seams. So if I would have planned everything exactly the same size, then they could have been perfectly even. But again, it's a bib. It's supposed to be fun. So all we have to do is line up this piece. And I want that selvage, again, off the edge too. So I'm going to slide it down a bit. I'm going to lay it at my sewing machine. I'm going to follow that pink to edge so that I create a nice straight line across the bib. And then I will cover up all of those stair step edges and they really don't need to be trimmed away because it's going to be on the inside no no one's ever going to see those <laughs> so now as i open this up and out you can see that i have covered those all up nicely and i can add one more piece to the very bottom to complete that bottom edge and then i could build upward from there now the other direction you can go is this is kind of building in horizontal rows, stacking up the bib, but you can also do vertical rows. So no matter where you start, usually I start in the center, you can work your up and down and work your way out, or you can work horizontally, kind of toward the middle, work toward the bottom and then cover towards the top. So it is your prerogative, which direction you go, um, on this one, again, this is similar to what we just, just did. I put together the, I put down the first piece with the house with the little bike design first, worked my way out and then worked my way to the bottom and then covered the top area in order to cover the entire batting, covering up that stitching or that um, marked line. So that I know I have everything covered. Okay. Let's see. Question. Um, Diane asks, why are you not doing that with the backing already on it? You could do that, but what I'm going to do is do the entire thing as like a pillow turn so that all my outer edges are going to be finished when I put the backing on. I had contemplated quilting through everything at once and then putting binding on this project. But then I looked at it and went, that means I have to put bias binding all the way around all those curves and then either hand stitch or machine stitch all of that bias binding down. Now, if I wanna produce something fast, I'm gonna run the other direction from bias binding as fast as I can get. Because by doing a turned edge here, we eliminate the bias binding altogether. But if you love to do bias binding, by all means, put your backing on your batting, stitch through all the layers, then go back and cut out your shape and add bias binding to the outer edge. It's just another design element, another choice. See, I'm here just to provide ideas and then you take them and run and make them your own. So good question, Diane. Thanks for asking that because it does make a difference on constructing the whole process, um, how the bib goes together. Okay, usually when quilters hear the word bias, they usually turn and hike the other direction, unless it adds a really special kind of kick to the outer edge of a project. So, so once you get that entire piece covered, I've got one here that I worked on a large one because my granddaughter is a little over a year and a half old. And I wanted to make an Easter bib for her. So here we go. I've got the entire shape covered top to bottom using those funny little chicks with the um, bunny ears. Of course, pink and a purple because what every little um, granddaughter wants is something that has a little bit of pink and purple in there somewhere. But then it was time to go back and machine quilt. Now, you can either machine quilt using a walking foot or an even feed foot. Now, a walking foot looks similar to this if you have um, one that you attach separately. So this is great for doing straight lines or even just um, meandering lines. So this 
is your best friend. And the most of us know how to use a walking foot. Then there is an even feed foot or a, a free motion foot that looks similar to something like this. It's uh, metal. It has maybe either an I or a U-shaped piece there on the foot so that you can easily um, maneuver and see the fabric where you're at. And either one of those works. There is also integrated dual feeds that um, on some machines that is a lever that you just let um, pull down and hooks into your presser foot to do the same thing as you would with a walking foot. There's also something called a dual feed, which is very large. It goes on the back and it has a belt that helps you easily slide the or walk the fabric through the machine, similar to a walking foot. So whether or not you have an integrated foot, you're using a dual feed, a walking foot or a free motion foot, this is the time when you get to play and do some quilting um, to make your project a little bit more interesting. Now, on this one, um, a lot of mine, I did a lot of straight lines or I did lazy lines, I call them. Let's see if I can find the, the lazy line one that you can actually see where I stitched at. Oh, these are all straight line ones. The lazy line one must be in the laundry. Okay, um, so I just did, let's see if I hold this up, you can see maybe in the shadows because it's been washed. The lines, I took a, a gray thread. I did some up and down. I even did some parallel lines across. It was just to hold the fabric in place and give it that kind of quilty look. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be intense. Just pick a line. Sometimes I was... Um, just basically picking a, a seam line and stitching a quarter inch from it and then maybe half an inch from it and just creating the quilted look there. On, I think you can see the, I picked orange thread. I went a little bit more bold on this one. It has been washed quite a few times. You can kind of see the quilty lines there. I just want that quilted texture to come out and it was a way to kind of play with the distances between um, lines to see what it would look like. Sometimes I do lazy lines. Basically, that means instead of driving a nice straight line, I'm just holding the fabric and let it weave down the project. And I just add as many lazy lines as I like. Again, it's just an, another design element to add to the project. Um, in this latest one, I thought I would play a little bit more. And some of the areas are going to be easier to pick up than others. I think there you can see it. I did, I don't even know for sure what you technically call these. They're like loops up, loop down, loop up, loop down, kind of like a ribbon candy, similar to that. So all the pink spaces got that. Well, these pieces got the ribbon candy. This one had big loops like the letter L. So cursive writing can be a source of inspiration for machine quilting. So think about that when you sit down to do your machine quilting. Um, I just did a, a lazy line through the turquoise. So it just, it just looks like waves, tiny little loops, kind of a wave with a loop back and forth, kind of a letter E or S kind of shape in the yellow strips and a simple meander with loops in the bunny section. Although the, it's not actual bunnies. I think they're chicks that are trying to be bunnies. I just did a really simple meander there with a white thread so that it wouldn't distract um, the, the print because that's the fun part of this. So I think everything actually had white color thread for machine quilting in this one. Okay. So once you have your piece all quilted, then it's time to take that big template and... Make sure that you have your design traced on the back side of your backing fabric. In this case, I had enough of the little chicks with the ears left over that I could use this as the back. So I have already then taken my template, laid it on the fabric and traced around this so that I have my stitching line now available to me. Now it's basically just laying this over the top and if you want to make sure that things are kind of level line, I use the bottom portion of my template as the, the straight line. And I did kind of a fold up of so many inches so I could say, okay, that's kind of the, the horizon line and matched it with my 
piecing on the front. But again, close counts. And making sure that I am staying within, you know, you don't want to shove it to one side or, or, or the other too far. You want to make sure that you have fabric underneath all the way around. Then I'm going to pin this in place. When I went and did the tracing, I decided that sometimes it's a good thing. I know myself really well to make a mark at the very bottom. That's going to be my opening and turning spot. And so I made an X on each side so that I remember to start and stop. When I've been making um, uh, multiples of these, you get on a roll, I start sewing and I forget to leave an opening spot. And you definitely need access to turn this right side out. So let's go ahead and do that stitching as we go around. Now, at that start and stop, you're going to want to do just, whoops, let me get my needle in the center position. I'm using that short stitch length like you use when you do piecing. So make sure that your machine is set in that quilting kind of stitch or at about a 2.0. Oh, I believe, yep, 2.0 stitch length because this is going to be a lot of curve and you're going to want it a nice um, smooth curve and you get that better with small stitches than you do with long stitches. Do a, just a little reinforcement stitch at the very beginning because you're going to tug on that just a bit when you turn it and then just follow that marked line all the way around the shape. And I just put a few pins to kind of hold things in place, but I'm just letting the feed dogs do the work of feeding that through the machine. And if you don't say exactly on the line, no one will know because we're going to be turning this very soon. Try to get your curve as smooth as possible. Some, some will feel more comfortable going slow, going around that curve. That's okay depends on how many of these you've done after a while. Staying as close to that line, you got to drive all the way around. So you got to do the inside neck area. And that's why that short stitch length is kind of helpful because that part's going to take the most stress when it's being worn or laundered. So let's get around the curve. And if you bobble or wobble a little, you can always go back and kind of correct the curve a bit. But remember, it is a bib. <laughs> okay, we get around to this edge. And then the next thing you're going to need is those nice long shears that I put that you needed um, actual show sewing shears in your supply list. The little thread snips are going to be good for doing the curves, but you're going to want those longer blades to do the outer cut. It's just so much easier to have a long blade to do a nice smooth cut. Okay, we're almost all the way around. Remembering when you get to that spot where I talked about putting an X to start and stop, you're going to want to do a reinforced stitch there. It doesn't have to be a lot, just a couple of tack stitches in one place. So one, two, three, and then cut thread. And then it's time to remove all your pins and do the flip and turn. So this is where those nice long blade scissors come in helpful so that you can trim this to about a little under a quarter inch. Maybe not as close as an eighth, but somewhere in between. Just getting that edge, all the extra fabric out of the way. And making sure you go down between, around the curve. And then I want to talk, I'm going to trim just half of it, and then we're going to talk about how to get that edge to turn nicely around the inside curve. Because inside curves, as quilters, we don't work with inside curves as much as garment sewers do. And if you're new to sewing, Maybe you've come from a garment background but and know these tips, but if you're a quilter and new to quilting, this might be something kind of foreign to you. And so I'm just going to stop at that point. This is our scrap. We are going to take those sharp scissors, those little tip scissors, and we're going to do clipping. Clipping allows the fabric to relax inside of a seam and open up. 
because right now there's a lot of pull here. And if I take my scissors and go in and snip into the seam allowance just every three eighths of an inch or so, it doesn't have to be exact, but I just use the very tips of my scissors to make snips into the fabric and the batting. It will help release the stress on that seam allowance. And the idea is that when we open it up, now it will pull into a straight line and the stress is taken out of the seam allowance there. So when we do the flip and turn, that it will lay nicely along those curves. Now, when you get down to your opening space, trimming this, what you'll, you're going to want to do is I go in and I kind of fold back the backing fabric, knowing that that's going to be the fold on the outside of my project. And I trim away some of that excess batting on the backside. I'm going to trim it and then I'll show you what I mean. Because you won't be able to really fold over the batting at the very bottom. Let's see, extra thread there. Let me go. I've trimmed away that bat, the batting there just a little bit so I can fold this edge down. And then I can go in either with an iron or just with your fingers and crease this. Now this is going to be that opening space where I go in and turn the entire project right side out. And I can turn it. I don't have all clipped yet. It won't be quite as pretty, but we can do that turn. And we kind of have to be gentle about it when we're trying to pull it through that hole so that we don't tear out the seam that we've created. But everything will go through that. It's about a three to four inch opening. Don't want to leave it too large because then you have to do the hand stitching to close it up later. So we want just enough room to turn this right side out. Oops, I got to get all my pieces through there so that it will open up and lay. And when I got done with mine, that outer edge just needed something to make it nice and crisp. And I found that going in and edge stitching the outer edge of my project was the ticket. Okay, I don't have all of this part trimmed yet, so I'm not going to worry about this part. But I did do the clipping down in here, and now you can see how nicely that turns back on itself along that curve curve because I did the clip into the seam allowance. So I will go ahead and do that on the outside curve too of the closure part. So the, I just wanted you to see how nicely that will turn for you and do that on all of the curves, do that clipping process there. And this will be our closure at the very bottom, which we're going to hand stitch close. I'm going to bring in one of my other finished projects here so you can see I went in and did a quarter inch seam stitched all the way around that outer edge. And that's what, when you rolled that seam all the way to the outer edge and pressed it nicely, then you can just go and do that edge stitch all the way around in one fell swoop. And then when you have that done, it's add hook and loop or a plastic snap, some kind of closure to the top. Buttons are kind of hard to make buttonholes, so hook and loop tape or Velcro is probably the quickest for most of us. So I put one piece here, one piece on the back so that they overlap. And when I apply mine, I always do a zigzag off the edge of the Velcro because most Velcro base is quite um, rigid and I don't want it to scratch. So by doing that zigzag um, off the edge, I don't know if you can actually see it on camera there or not, but I actually stitch right off the edge and kind of encase that edge and thread so that it lays nice and flat. And then your bib is complete. So that is bib building 101. Let's see. We had a question from Karen. I see you have hmm, left. She, uh, lefty shears could be. Could you share the brand? Mm, not lefties. These are right-handed. Actually, I wonder if these actually would go both directions. No, because of the way the blades are stacked, this pair happens to be a Kai scissors. Kai does make a left-handed scissors also because I worked in a shop where we sold them. So these are a Kai brand scissors. They have a really nice um, blade, the nice sharp edge. Um, these are the brand that I would recommend if you want to invest in a good pair. They're on the professional level um, blades. They keep their sharp edge very nicely. So 
Kai, and it's spelled K-A-I. And they are out of Japan, I believe. So one of the nicer pairs of shears out there on the market. Just letting you know what things I use, what I enjoy, so that if you are going to invest in something, that is a good pair to do. Um, Erica's question. Okay, do you have to do end end to end edge to edge quilting horizontally or vertically to ensure every the, your thread is secure? Um, no. Usually, when I'm doing the edge to edge, I'm running back over another seam. So that's a good question though, on securing seams. So my short seams in here, when I do my next piece over the top, I'm running over those stitching lines, which will help secure them. So I don't have to do a back tack there. Um, the quilting then secures it further so that, and when I did my quilting, it's when everything is opened up. And so I'm stitching all the way off the edge to do my machine quilting. So when you do your kind of your building process, you're running over one seam after the other, and you're working all the way to the outer edge. And then when you do quilting, you're going to do the same thing. I'm going all the way to the outer edge when I start and stop. If not, make sure you tie off or bear, uh, take the threads to the bottom and tie them in a knot to secure. But the machine quilting process I like to, because I'm doing them fast, is to do them all the way from the outer edge to the outer edge. That way I don't have to worry about tying off any threads. And then when you do the layering and turning process, and then that quarter inch seam along the edge, you're running over those seams again, so that all of your seam allowances, all of your stitching is very secure. These have been through the laundry, I don't know how many times, and I haven't had any issues with stitching popping. Make sure that you use that short stitch length, though, that 2.0 stitch length on your machine, just like you would do if you were piecing. So if you're new to piecing and you've never heard that before, that shorter stitch length will help your seams from popping or having anything um, separate, and especially in something that will be washed and um, laundered a lot, that short stitch length is the ticket. So you're going to be running over seams, you're working edge to edge when you're doing the quilting, and then the turning process and then running over the um, most all of the stitching again and securing that out edge with an edge stitch. So everything will be secure and ready to go. So thanks for joining me for Bib Building 101. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with um, another topic. Maybe not a project next time, maybe just a topic of discussion. So join me again in a couple of weeks for live here on Facebook, our website, or on YouTube. Thanks for joining me today.